Take your Bibles, turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. You'll also find it in the program guide. Scripture's points will be shown to you on the screen as we go through the message this morning. But as you find your place in the Bible this morning to Malachi 3, I just want to say to you, um, and I try to do this in a very intentional way every single Sunday by being at a different door and greeting as many people as I possibly can. But I just want you to know and to sense and to feel and to accept as a personal gesture from my heart to yours that I love you. And I appreciate you. And I'm so thankful to God for you. Thankful for the, the leadership he's given me in your life. I consider it an honor that you entrust your spiritual life development to me, to this team that works very hard for you. And I don't know, sometimes people don't hear enough that they're loved. And I just want you to know from me, if nobody else tells you today that they love you, that I love you. And I appreciate you very much. I'm so thankful to God for you. Amen. This morning, I'm going to be sharing with you uh, a message that touches upon the favor of God. We'll also be continuing that thought next week of how the, the Lord wants to bless us. And uh, last fall, I shared with you a series of messages on favor. And um, it was dealing with favor in a variety of areas of our life. And almost immediately after that, I just began to sense and to recognize God's favor here in, on the church. I, I want you to know this. I mean, Labor Day, it's kind of difficult to tell. We're in two services, it's difficult to tell. But, but we have over a 1,000 people worshiping with us now this fall that wasn't worshiping with us last fall in person. Can you give the Lord a hand clap for that? Yes. Amen. Here's another thing. We have an equal number. It's, it's somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 in person, but we're also 1,000 and 1,500 up online with people watching us online more than we were last fall. Come on. Let's brag on the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so God's favor has just been so good to work in us. And so with this growth of new people coming to our church, people are coming from a variety of backgrounds, I think this is a message that we need to continue to reemphasize because favor does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Favor is God's grace at work in our life to bless us in ways that we can never accomplish by human means. And so uh, today I'm gonna share with you about favor and blessing and then next week you're gonna be hearing a similar theme as well. But I wanna share with you this message called the favor principle. And it's particularly look, looking at favor that God gives us through our faithfulness in giving to him. Now, I don't speak a lot on giving. If you're here every single Sunday, you will know that only really a couple times a year that I talk about this. I try to teach a little bit in the offering times so that we're helping people understand what we believe about God and how he blesses us through our financial giving. But I don't talk about it a lot. I, I grew up in a family uh, that was a non-minister background, non-ministry background. We were first generation Christians. And so I was very sensitive to the criticisms that people have about pastors and churches and money, and I just never wanted to be that guy, you know, that was the stereotype in a lot of people's minds. But as I've gone through the years and, and gained confidence and saw God's hand move in my own life, I've come to understand that this message dealing with our faithfulness and God's blessing upon us through our uh, faithfulness and finance is one of the most crucial and important messages that I can preach to you that will affect the quality of your everyday life. There are so many of us that are living lives uh, that are under pressure, stressed out, in conflict with people around us, particularly in marriages, because of a lack of finances or resources in our life. And God doesn't want us to live that way. In fact, God has given us a plan, a prescription in his word that we'll give to him and honor him the right way. God will bless us in such a way that we'll have more than what we need. And that will take away the pressure and the stress and many times the the. Uh, the drain of joy that occurs in a lot of lives, even in the lives of believers. And so I just want to be faithful to share with you some things. It's not only a reflection of things that God has done in my personal life, but what his word says about this. Here's what I've learned in my personal life. Though money is a huge issue, money can't solve every problem or issue in my life. That's the balance. I'm not trying to sell you on something this morning where you give to God and everything becomes perfect. I, I've not lived at any station or phase or season in my life where everything's been completely perfect. But I have found that I've been blessed in every season of my life. And that blessing has transcended beyond money to things that money cannot buy. And so when we talk about how that God wants to bless us today, we're talking about the whole spectrum of God's blessing in our life. When I'm obedient to God materially, I express to him my complete dependence upon his lordship in tangible, identifiable, measurable, and material ways. And that's important. Because when we begin to give materially, you're not just giving money, you're giving your blood, sweat, and tears. You worked hard for that money. 
Either in your job this week, you may be retired. You've worked hard throughout your life to give that away. You're giving your time away. You're giving your effort. You're giving all your toil and strength to the process of giving in an offering. But I want us to read now what happens when we commit ourselves to God in complete dependence. This is the classic passage of Scripture that the Bible deals with concerning the tithe, the 10% in our life. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, down through verse 12, bring all the tithes, the 10%, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me. Some translation says, prove me. I will paraphrase it and say, dare me. Dare me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer, the seed eater, for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Father, this morning, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in relationship with you. God, I thank you for the opportunity to give to you. Father, I'm just praying that you will confirm the promises of your word and your blessing and favor in our lives in material ways, in ways that we can identify in our lives that are supernatural. God, I'm praying that you will give us ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts to receive, and beyond that, Lord, faith to obey, courage to obey, that in obeying you, we can see, Lord, your hand of blessing released powerfully into our lives. God, I love you. I know these people love you, and I know that you love us even more. So work through us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen. When we recognize the operation of God's favor in our life in response to our giving, the first thing that you notice in this passage is that it exceeds a mere monetary response from God. In other words, as I said earlier, God is not just concerned about giving you money. He's concerned about touching every area of your life that's important to you. God is holistic in his viewpoint. God is holistic in the way that he operates and responds to us. Some people want to treat God like a heavenly slot machine where we put a few quarters in and get thousands in return. Listen, that, that's, that's not the way this thing works. I believe God has the ability to do that. God can do whatever he wants to do. But God is wanting a heartfelt response from you. God is wanting uh, dedications of discipline and obedience in your life. And that as you trust him in the way that his word says to trust him, he will cause his blessing and favor to rest upon your life in a consistent and measurable way. God wants you to begin to see that your response to him is more than just a monetary response, but it is a response of the heart so that he can respond to you from his heart to bless every area of your life, to bless your finances, yes, but to bless your family, to bless your relationships, to bless the work of your hands, uh, to bless every aspect of peace and emotions inside of your heart. God wants to make sure that you are blessed by him in every area. Now, I'm not discounting God's ability to provide for you in whatever way he chooses, but I want to confront the mindset in the heart of the giver who selfishly expects God to always respond to them in in this way. God is going to be sovereign. He's going to respond the way he wants to respond, but he will respond in a way that blesses you beyond what you deserve. The giver that pleases God will give to God in response to who he is, so he's Lord, with a heart of worship, God, you've been so good to me, then gratefully they will receive whatever God does in blessing their lives. And so this morning, I want to run real quickly. I want you to fill in a lot of blanks here on the front end of this message That's really a breakdown of Malachi 3, 10 through 12. This is gonna be like lightning round or speed dating, whatever that is. I've been married a long time. But it's gonna move fast, all right? So Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. These are all the things that God does in responding to us with this spectrum of blessing that he wants to bring into our life. The first thing he says in this patch is he said, he would open for you the windows of heaven. Write this down. God will give you access to the supernatural. So God says, when you give him with the tithe of 10%, He will open up heaven and he will pour out his blessing upon your life. So let's think for a second about heaven. What's in heaven? Well, God's in heaven. Uh, but God's, God's not like the Federal Reserve or the, or the National Bank up there. I mean, yeah, he's got things up there, but he's got more than just resources. He's got peace. He's got joy. He's got his presence. He's got healing power. He's got righteousness. He's got uh, help and encouragement and hope. He said, whatever that is good in me in heaven I will open up and I will pour it out to you on earth. So think about this. As we're emptying a portion of who we are and our resources to him, God says, I will open up heaven to pour out my supernatural into your life. I will fill you up with the things of heaven. How how many knows that that's, that's a pretty exciting thought today? 
that we could create an access to the supernatural, we could create access to the power of God simply through our giving. He says in this passage, to try me now in this. Another translation, prove me now in this. I'm taking a paraphrase, dare me in this. How many of you as teenagers ever played truth or dare? I'm sure God has forgiven you for what you did when you <laughs> played that game. <laughs> but dare, remember truth and dare? Okay, everybody chose the dare. And I dare you to do this, I dare you to do that. Well, this is where God says, I dare you in this. This is the only place in the word of God where he dares us to do a particular action. Because he said, when, he said, when you begin to take this dare, when you prove me now in this, I'm gonna show up. And here's how I'm gonna show up. The first thing I'm gonna do in showing up in your life is I'm gonna pour heaven out on you. I'm gonna begin to bless you over the spectrum of your life to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Here's the second thing. He says, I will pour out blessing. So here's fill in this blank. He will grant you prosperity through surrender. Make no mistake, for you to give to God the way he says, 10% of what you have, that's surrender. Because it's not human, it's not fleshly, it's not natural for you to give something that you'd rather keep for yourself. We're in a dog eat dog world. Everybody wants to get what they can get. And so for us to give to a God we've never seen, a God we've never met in the flesh, a God who only gives us promises from a book that's hundreds and thousands of years old, there is an act of surrender that takes place in that. But God always responds to surrender. Every time that we surrender to him, he begins to pour out something of himself and his goodness upon our lives. Here's the third thing. He says that there will not be room enough to receive it. Fill in this blank, there will be more than enough resources. The reason that most people do not give to God is because they said, if I give that away, I will not have enough to meet the needs of my life. Isn't that right? If I, if I give the way the pastor says that the Bible tells me to give, I can't make the mortgage payment at the end of the month. I can't, I can't pay the medical bills. I can't pay the credit card statement. I can't do these things. And God says, I will literally give you more than enough when you give to me. That I will take your not enough and make it more than enough. That when you begin to give out of your life, I will bless you in such a way that you will not have room enough to receive it. There will be an overflow of my blessings in your life. Then he says, the next thing, he will rebuke the devourer. Fill in this blank. That is representing divine protection. He'll rebuke the devourer. Devourer means seed eater. So literally every time we give to God, we're planting seed. We're planting seed. We're planting seed and we're saying that God will rebuke the seed eater, the one that would come and take away the seed. He will push him back on our behalf. I can't tell you how many times living now over the last year and a half in this valley that farmers have called me and said, Pastor, I've watched the weather forecast and there's a storm coming our way and if it rains right now, it's gonna ruin a big portion of our crops. You gotta pray. And every time that I'm asked to pray like that, that's what I pray. I say, God rebuke the devourer on our behalf. If there's things that's going to harm this economy, that's gonna affect people's lives, Lord, would you please protect us right now? Rebuke the devourer on our behalf. I can remember one time I prayed this prayer. We, uh, we were pastoring in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we'd just been through a year and a half building program. And I had worked myself to death in getting that building built. It was the night before the dedication of that building. And the, the, the skies turn dark, as it often does in Oklahoma, and the winds begin to blow, and I turn on the television set, and there was a tornado coming to our area. In fact, the, the, the meteorologist said that, that that tornado, an F3, F4 tornado, was headed directly for New Spring Family Church. He said that on the evening news. That was the name of my church, the church that we had just built. So here's the first thing I said to God. God, if that tornado destroys that building, I quit. I'm, I'm done. Listen... <laughs> It's been nice knowing you, but peace out, God. I'm, I, I'm, it's over, okay? I, I, can't, I can't do this, Lord. But the second thing I begin to pray is, Lord, rebuke the devourer. Father, I pray right now for divine protection. Lord, we've been faithful to you. We have given, we have worked, we have sacrificed. We've built this building to reach people for you. So right now, whatever is happening in that storm, would you protect us right now? I promise you, this is not evangelistically speaking. I'm not telling Christian lies right now. On the evening news, I'm literally beside my bed praying with the TV on. The meteorologists had a spotter out there in our area. And they said that that tornado was on the ground headed directly for the church. And that right before it got to the church, it picked up, went up into the clouds, went over the church and down on the other side and kept on running. <laughs> Yeah. 
No, I wish I could tell you that my faith did that. No, the, the God of covenant did that. Yes. The God that I put my life in, the God, the God I've invested my money in, the, the God I've given my life and trusted for salvation, that's the God that in that moment rebuked the devourer on my behalf. And that's what God can do. Even when others are being destroyed all around us, God will protect us because we're in covenant with him. And then it says that the vine shall not fail to bear fruit. So this tells us, write this down, that God will give favor upon your work. God rebukes the devourer. That's what he does. We don't have any power to do that. That's, that's God's business. But when he blesses the fruit of, of our hands, that's where we cooperate with God. That's where God's hand reaches through your hands. Some of you need God to reach through your hands in your business. Some of you need God to reach his hands through your hands in your work so that when God's hands begin to work through your hands that you'll get favor, blessings, promotion, the business will pick up, prosperity will be poured out on you. Why? Because it's not you, it's God reaching through you. He says, I will bless the work of your hands. Here's what I believe. Here's what I'm gonna speak over you. God wants to bless you on the job. He wants to promote you. You said, Pastor, I've been working this job for 30 years. I've been passed over a dozen times. Not today in Jesus' name. If you will begin to give and trust God with your resources, I believe that God will begin to elevate you and promote you, that he'll make you a manager, a supervisor. He'll give you some other designation in your work. If you were a million-dollar business, that God will make you a $2 million business next year. That God will begin to multiply whatever is going on in your life as you begin to put your trust in him. That's what God does when he says that he will bless the work of our hands. The next thing is, is that all nations will call you blessed. Fill in these blanks. That's where the activity of God that creates a notable, noticeable difference in your life. There's an activity of God that creates a noticeable difference in your life. Other people, other nations, he was referring to nations that are outside the covenant of God that don't understand spiritual principles will rise up and notice God's blessing on you. How many people you work with is not saved? A bunch, I'm sure. And yet you work cubicle beside cubicle with them, shoulder to shoulder with them. You make the same amount of money as they do. You're getting the same hourly wage, the same salary, but yet when you begin to trust God with your resources, God begins to bless you and promote you. God begins to do things in you that seems like you're living on a completely different salary than the person standing next to you does. How does that happen? It's because you've gotten plugged into the economy of God and not the economy of this world. That person, when they do not know God and they're not giving to God, they are plugged into the economy of their own labor. They're, they're plugged into the economy of California, God help them. And, <laughs> and they're plugged into the economy of the United States of America. But when we begin to give to God and trust him with the way the word tells us to trust him, we begin to get plugged into an economy not made with human hands. We begin to plug into an economy that's not of this world. We begin to plug into an economy of abundance, an abundance of overflow, an abundance of blessing and grace and resources that simply the other people in this world cannot connect to. So when you begin to trust God like that, he will create a noticeable difference in your life. Here's what God promises. When you give to God, he will favor your life with money and things that money cannot buy. All of us want more money. Don't sit there and act like a liar and a hypocrite to me. You want more money. I know you do. But here's what I've found through life. When God blesses you with things that money cannot buy, sometimes that's more powerful because literally there's no price that can be associated with it. Again, money can't solve all the problems of your life. When you can lay down at night with peace in your heart, when you can have loving relationships with your family, when you can walk in divine health, when you can begin to realize that God protects you from things that devour other people, there is something about that that you cannot put a price like It is priceless today. And God will bless you with the priceless things of life. So very quickly, I wanna transition and give you several statements about the favor of God so that you can understand this work of grace in your life. Number one, favor is a shortcut to uncommon success. Write that down. Favor is a shortcut to uncommon success. When I talk about shortcuts, some of you automatically begin to think that that's wrong. Like there's a negative connotation with shortcut. Like we're, we're gaming the system, we're breaking the law, we're, we're doing something crooked or shady. But that's not what I'm talking about. Favor is a shortcut to uncommon success. Now, yesterday I landed in LAX at 11.50 in the morning and then I had to get to my car and I had to 
um, uh, get my luggage, and then I had to get in the car, and I had to drive to Visalia because I had to sign a bunch of paperwork associated with a closing, some things that we're doing here at the church, on a couple of things, and I had to be there by 345. And I want to tell you, Pastor Mark was looking for some shortcuts. And I want to tell you, I made it here by 345, and I stopped for gas. And you say, Pastor, did you break any law of God? And man, that's none of your business. I don't know. <laughs> Me and Jesus, we've already worked it out. I, I've got cleansing before I came out here today. This is not the way life works. We, we don't have enough time to do what we need to do. We, we don't have enough time to see the dream that we have in our heart come to pass. We, we don't have enough time to get done all the things that we want to get done. So what happens? God gives us favor that becomes a shortcut to uncommon success. What does that mean? Well, uh, when I say shortcut, I'm simply recognizing that God can work in our lives in ways and in speeds that define common human wisdom. The world says for you to go from A to B, it's gonna take 10 years. God can do it in a day. The, the, the world says, listen, you're sick and you're gonna have to have 14 months of chemotherapy and three months of radiation and three surgeries to do this. And God says, I can heal you in a moment, my grace. Boom. <laughs> favor. So favor is a shortcut to uncommon success. In the Bible, God took Joseph from the prison to the palace in a strategic moment of favor. Ex-con, prime minister, falsely accused in a moment. Boom. That's favor. God caused the walls of Jericho to fall in a decisive moment that defied conventional means of warfare. But please understand that favor goes beyond the issues of money. It deals with influence, authority, works of healing and restoration, deliverance from sin and trouble, fulfillment of the deep desires of your heart. And you may be in a battle right now in your life. There may be warfare happening around you that you have determined that you will be in forever. But I just came to tell you this morning, if I can, if I can prophesy into your life for a moment, in a moment of God's favor, the struggle can end. The lawsuit can end. The healing can come. The blessing can manifest. The restoration of the relationship can happen. God can do it in a moment because God is a God who favors the lives of his obedient children. Number two, favor is not a miracle. It is the reward for appropriate behavior and cooperation with God. It's not a miracle. It's a reward for appropriate behavior and cooperation with God. So is it miraculous? Oh, absolutely. Is it supernatural? No doubt about it. But it's not a miracle in the sense that it came out of nowhere in an unexplainable way. No, the Lord says this, if you'll do this, I'll do this. What he does, does it always make sense to us? No, I don't know how that I can live better on 90% than 100%. I can't figure that out, but I know what God has said. God has already told me, if you'll do one, two, three, four, five, I'll do all the rest. And this is how I will do it. I will open up heaven. I will pour out blessing. I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll do all these things, but you've got to do what I tell you to do. So favor then becomes the outcome for appropriate behavior and cooperation with God by simply doing what God says in obedience. So favor comes to us because it's the response of a good God who rewards his children for obedience to his word. Let me ask you about your kids. When you're raising your kids, which child did you reward, the obedient one or the disobedient one? It should have been the obedient one. I just came from a very long flight where a lot of disobedient kids were getting rewarded, and I don't understand that. That's not my business. But if you want to enforce good behavior, you reward the obedient. If you want to ingrain rebellion in the disobedient, reward them when they do wrong. But God rewards those who are obedient. I know we want God to bless our mess. We, we want God to just take us as we are in his mercy. He's capable, though, of turning our mess into a miracle or our mess into a message or our test into a testimony. However, God wants us to obey what he has told us to do, and when we do, he will bless us in ways that we can never imagine. So we need to understand that favor is something that can be gained and something that can be lost. If you're walking in obedience with God, you can gain favor. If you wanna get rebellious and arrogant, like humility in your life, you can go your own way and you will lose that favor. I promise you, you will lose that favor. So it can be gained and it can be lost. Favor does not mean that every situation in your life will be perfect. 
There has not been a phase, a moment, a season in my life where my life has been perfect. But every moment, every phase, and every season of my life has been blessed when I've walked in obedience with God. There's a difference between perfect and blessed. That even in the midst of hard things and difficult times and suffering and disappointments, there is still a ministry of God taking place in our life that's blessing us in the midst of difficult things. Your life will not become perfect just because you decide to give overnight, but it will be blessed. Perfection in any sense will not be experienced until we get to heaven. However, it does mean that in every imperfect situation, there is a perfect God who is working on our behalf to bring something good out of the bad things that we're going through. So favor requires our obedience and our cooperation. Here's something to remember. Favor must become a seed before it can become a harvest. It's not on the screen, but you need to write that down. Favor must first become a seed before it becomes a harvest. That simply means that we give God something to work with. When I see that the economy is turning against us, recession, depression, whatever you wanna call it, I don't get all upset because I've got seed in the ground. Are you with me? I've been giving to God long enough, consistently, that regardless of what this world brings me or what happens in the economy around me, it doesn't matter because I've got seed in the ground. And if I've got seed in the ground, there will not be crop failure because I serve the God the harvest. And I've trusted God with the seeds of my obedience so that when my time of need comes, he will give me a harvest of supply that the world cannot give me. So favor must first become a seed before it can become a harvest. Some of us desperately need a harvest in our lives, but you must have seed in the ground before you can expect a harvest. Here's number three, favor through giving brings multiplication in a world dominated by addition. When we view favor as a seed, we begin to understand that God wants to grow us exponentially through simple acts of obedience. I have a picture on the screen here that'll help you understand. This is an ear of corn. And when you begin to plant for corn, it's just one kernel, it's just one seed. And when nature does what nature's supposed to do, it produces multiplication. Not addition, multiplication. So that one seed begins to produce hundreds of kernels for us to consume. When we begin to act in obedience with God and we trust our obedience as a seed and God does what God always does and God is not fickle like nature where there are dry seasons and wet seasons and there's crop failure and this and that and the other and pests that come along to destroy the crops. No, no, God cannot be thwarted. God cannot be knocked off his throne. God cannot do anything but be faithful to his word. And when God does what God's supposed to do, he always takes that seed of obedience and turns it into a harvest of blessings that's exponentially multiplied more and more than what we initially gave to him. Can you say amen to that? I want to say to our young people as they're setting out to live their life, I want you to begin to plant some seeds of obedience now because if you do, you will never lack for resources when it comes to your future. If, the sooner you can begin to learn to honor God with what you have as a seed, God will begin to multiply you in a world of addition. How does he do that? Simple acts of obedience. As we obey God in ordinary principles of behavior, he will multiply blessings in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I want God to bless my life extravagantly. Let me give you a multiple choice quiz for a moment. If God is able to bless you, and we know that he is, how do you want God to bless you? In an underwhelming way, A. B, one-to-one. C, generously. Or D, extravagantly. Would you please make your choice right now? D, all of us D. Are, Are we wrong in wanting God to bless us extravagantly? No. Is it any harder for God to bless you in a simple sort of way or an extravagant sort of way? No, it's an act of his grace. So how is it that I attract the extravagant behavior of God into my life? Well, my life first must become extravagant. I I must begin to demonstrate to God a heart of what I expect to receive. So in other words, today, if you're gonna give to God, what do you wanna give him? A spoonful, a shovel, or a dump truck? Dump truck. Everybody shouting dump truck, though, that hurts a little bit. You give God a dump truck, that's scary. Uh, That means that you're giving him beyond what's conventional. You're giving him beyond what's ordinary. You're giving him something out of your life that's gonna scare you a little bit. So let me give you the three different levels of giving. The first level of giving is the tithe. The tithe is the minimum. Some people look at tithe as the destination. Tithe is the starting point. When you come into relationship with Jesus and you're saved, 
tithe, 10%. That, that's, that's what he wants you to do. Anything below that's not tithing, it's tipping. I, I'm not against tipping. You got to start somewhere. But really, if you look biblically, and I can only speak about what's biblical. The biblical minimum is tithe. That's where you start. And then the second level is offerings. We say, would you give in the tithe and the offering? Well, tithes would be like the tithe, the 10%, and offerings would be like what we give to missions over and above the tithe. And then the third level is extravagant offerings. So what are extravagant offerings? Well, I just want to illustrate this. Back in March, we made the commitments to the missions convention and what we would give to God. I knew that I could not give dollar for dollar uh, of the most prosperous, wealthiest person in our church. I, I, I couldn't do that, okay? I, I, there's a certain amount of money that I make. I'm blessed in what I make, but I, I can't give dollar for dollar. So I made a determination in my heart because I want to live an extravagant life before God that I wanted to give the highest percentage of any person in the church. Because I'm the pastor, I'm the leader. I want to give the highest percentage of my offering to God of anybody in the church, the other thing I said I wanted to do uh, many years ago that I've now begun to live out is that I wanted the biggest check that I write every month to be to God and not to my mortgage payment. I'm not bragging, but I'm just telling you God through proving himself to me and through his grace in my life with what I give to him in tithe and offering and missions and extravagant offerings, I give almost twice as much to God as I give to my mortgage every month. But it's taken me some years to get there. You say, so, so, so what's the point, Pastor? Well, extravagant offerings, this is the way you define it. Extravagant offerings scares you a little bit. So, so if you can give the tithe, the 10%, okay, we, it is what it is, and you give an offering, but it's, it's really something that you know you can do. That, that, that's just an offering. But if you give an extravagant offering, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna make you shake a little bit in your boots. It's gonna make you begin to wonder, God, unless you show up, whoa, I don't know if I can do this or not. Folks, that's called living by faith. It's when you get into that faith realm of giving to God that God begins to open up blessings in your life that's supernatural. In the building of the temple, King David gave $21 billion according to today's economy, 21 billion. No wonder he was favored so extravagantly. Solomon sacrificed a thousand bulls and worshiped to God when one would have done just fine. That's what the Bible asks is one bull, he gave a thousand. You know who also gave extravagantly? The unnamed widow in the book of New, in the New Testament who gave two pennies because that's all she had. She gave it all. It was really the unnamed widow that inspired me in my own giving to say, listen, I can never give dollar for dollar with Warren Buffett or Bill Gates if they're believers in Jesus. I can't give that amount, but I wanna give the highest percentage I can possibly give so that I give extravagantly to God and God can honor the faith that I've put into his care. That unnamed widow, she blows us all away because she gave everything she had. The widow of Zarephath in the Old Testament took all the oil, all the meal, and gave it to the prophet Elijah. That is extravagance. It's not about a dollar amount. It's about a position of the heart that trusts God with everything that we have. And finally, in John chapter 12, verse 3, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, came and anointed Jesus with an alabaster jar of perfume. It was equivalent to a year's wages. She broke it open poured it on the head of Jesus, all the way down to his feet, and everyone in, atten in attendance criticized her. Everyone there thought it was extravagant. They thought it was extravagant for her to do it. They thought it was extravagant for Jesus to receive it. So let me give you quickly some, in closing, some insights concerning extravagance. Number one, people will always misunderstand and criticize your extravagance. In John chapter 12, verse six, who was Mary's chief critic? It was Judas. The guy who was stealing from the treasury of Jesus. The guy who would later sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Judas, in that moment, prior to his fall, crosses his arm and says, if she was really a Christian, she should take the money she spent on that jar of perfume and have given it to the poor. What is she doing giving that money to Jesus, and what in the world is Jesus doing receiving it? Look at him. He's just sitting there as that perfume, that oil, that perfume is poured out all over him. That is, that's wrong. That's excessive. That's extravagant. Let me give you a principle here. When we criticize extravagance, it only reveals issues of selfishness and sin in our own lives. Let me give you another example of extravagance when it was criticized. King David, the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem. The Bible says that he was dancing extravagantly so much that he danced out of his clothes, he, he became naked. I want you to know I want to live extravagantly, but you'll never have to worry about that happening and you need to thank God for it. 
But while he was dancing so extravagantly and his clothes came off, his wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul, was standing up in a balcony looking down on him and she was criticizing him for his worship in her heart. That's what the Bible says. Here's what I've learned. Whether it's related to your giving or your worship, you will either be a giver or a worshiper or you will become critical of those who do. When you begin to point your finger in judgment toward other people, like why do they give so much or why do they worship so fervently, you're only saying to yourself, that's a person that loves Jesus more than I do. So I want to remain a giver. I want to remain a worshiper. Number two, extravagance stems from a recognition of the goodness of God. Why would Mary do this? Because Jesus raised her brother from the dead just months earlier. When you see what God can do, there is no act of service that's too much for him. There's no act of worship that is excessive enough when you see the power of God. Number three, God uses extravagance for unique and special purposes. Mary didn't know it. The people there assembled didn't know it. Only Jesus knew it. But days from there, he would be crucified. That jar of perfume that she poured out literally was the preparation, the anointing of his body for his coming death. And nobody in the room knew it but Jesus. It even talks about it in the text itself in John 12. Listen, it is so important for you to give what God tells you to give. Here's what he's already told you to give, 10%. That's that's just, that's the way it is. But when God tells you to give extravagantly over and above, you gotta do exactly what he tells you to do because there's a purpose in your giving that you cannot see in the present moment. There is something that God will use for that money that only heaven will reveal. I, I can remember one time, and I didn't tell this in the first service, and I've got to go fast. I'm sorry, I'm talking fast. But I remember meeting a, a missionary one time at our national meeting, and I was, uh, he told me, he said, don't, don't give to me, I got all the money I need. And, and I was driving home from Orlando, Florida, back to Georgia, and when I was on the way home, the Lord says, take up an offering for that guy the next morning. I was like, oh, Lord, we're kind of stretched right now. I, I don't want to take another offering from the people. I don't want them thinking we're trying to get in their back pocket. And God said, take up an offering and give to that guy. We took up the offering, it was like 23 or 24,000, one of the biggest offerings we've ever taken in that church. 23, 24,000 and change. I called him the next morning and said, hey, we took an offering for you. He said, I told you not to give anything. I don't want your money. I said, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that I'm supposed to give. So I, he said, okay, well, I appreciate it. Here's where you send it to, you know, thank you. I was like, wow, a lot of appreciation here, you know. I was already thinking about another missionary to give it to. I mean, he was like, I don't want your money. He calls him back two hours later. He said, uh, Pastor Mark, he said, I, I wanna apologize for our conversation earlier. He said, I got off the phone with you and I received a call from the Middle East where he's a missionary. And there were people there, they're experiencing a revival among the Muslims. And he said that the Lord had spoken to the pastor that he should go into one of the centers of Islam in the world and to start a church. And I can't tell you any more details than that and that he was bringing people from all over the Muslim world, Indonesia, all these different places in order to be able to plant this church. And there's a specific amount of money that they need. He said, could you please tell me the amount of money your church took up? I, I'm, I'm gonna make this up because it's been some years. I said, yeah, it's like $24,556. He said, pastor. He said, I, I've got the invoice, the email sent in front of me right now. He said, that pastor just said that he totaled up everything he needed for that trip and it's $24,556. Go ahead, Marco, go ahead. When God asks you to give, he's asking you to give toward things you can't even see. That's right. Can I tell you that right now, secretly somewhere in the Muslim world, in one of the great centers, there's a church that's been planted because somehow God spoke to me on the way back from a trip to Orlando, Florida to take up an offering was the exact amount of money that was needed for a team to go in there and to start that church. And today, right there in the heart of darkness, right now somewhere in the world, a church is thriving because someone was obedient. People in that offering were obedient to give exactly what God told them to give. Folks, when you begin to give, God is using you for a strategic purpose to change the world. I got more to say, I gotta stop. I was in Tanzania this week. Tanzania, the leader of that country, he he started uh, 13 years ago, I believe, with 3,000 churches. Now, 13 years later, he's raised up 15,000 churches. Nowhere in the world is a church growing like it is in Tanzania. I had a driver given to me because when I'm there, you know, it's not good for me to drive. They drive on the wrong side of the road like the British do. And 
<laughs> it would have been bad for me to be try to drive around. So he gave me a driver, and he was the national director of youth ministry for Tanzania. And he was talking to me about a situation in which they had a pastor and uh, they, they got in difficulty. Most of our pastors don't have transportation needs. And he said, I, I will receive 71 youth leaders all around the nation and they don't have transportation to do their work. He said, Pastor, we, we can buy uh, a motorcycle for $1,000, brand new Chinese made motorcycle. He said, we, the church was able to buy one. Somebody in America said that they would give 10,000. So now we have 11, but there's 60 more of our leaders that don't have transportation. You know what I want to do? I want to write him a check right there. Just say, here it is, 60,000. Just get them on those bicycles. Get them on those motorcycles. Get them going out there to all the world. See, here's, here's the deal. When we begin to give to God every week in that offering, 10% of that offering, then plus all the stuff you give to missions is going all around the world to do things just like that, to buy motorcycles, to build Bible colleges, to feed hungry people, to, to respond to people in disaster, to, to go where there's the, the hurting and the lost and the broken. Your, your money is changing the world is you're faithful to give to God every, every week. And today I want you to see the tremendous power that your life makes by giving to God and begin to trust Him with what you have because I will tell you, if every single person in this church tithed every week, we could alle alleviate human suffering to a great deal in all of Tulare County and around the world. 6% of all Christians tithe, about 25% of people if I sell your first tithe. If 100% gave, we could wipe out illiteracy, take your choice, hunger, and I think we could, we could, we could make a dent in homelessness in Tulare County. If everybody would just give what God's already told you to give, we could literally change the world to this church. We could reach the city for God. We could impact the Central Valley, not just here, but in Fresno and Bakersfield and Modesto. We could... Folks, if we would just give to God, we would unleash the power of a church that could change the world. And today, God wants to use you to do it. Father, this morning, thank you. Praise you. Lord, my time is up. I haven't said everything I want to say, but God, I trust you to make up the difference in my life today. I pray, Lord, for people who are here and lost. They've come to church that's talking about money, and they're like, oh, I don't know about this. But Lord, along the way, they've heard about you and what you can do in the lives of people to bless and to heal. And I think there's some people out there saying, Lord, I want to serve a God like that. Lord, already you saved 35 or 40 people in the first service on a message on money. God saved 35, 40, 50, or 60 in this room right now. People who need a living God in their life, Lord, in the midst of what they're going through. And now, God, I pray for Christians, people who trust you, that God, they'll begin to live up, Lord, to the, the, the promises of your word, to do what you tell them to do, so that, Lord, we can unleash this church to change the world. Father, I ask it now in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Say, Pastor, I'm here, and I'm one of those lost people you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, Pastor, I'm kind of caught off guard. You're talking about money today, but man, there's something in here that's pulling on my heart that says, I, I need to get it right. I want to serve a God of power like you described today. I want God to come in and to meet my needs spiritually, physically, financially. I, I need a God like that in my life. If you're here and you're lost without God and you're ready to make a decision to follow him, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. That's me. I, I need Jesus in my life today. Bless you. Bless you, bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you, standing up in the back. Thank you, up in the risers, I'm looking for you. Get right here at the front, thank you. Risers up to the right, in the center, looking for you. Anybody there? Nobody in the center, over to the left, looking over there. Say, I, I need a God like that. Yeah, I see your hands right here on the bottom floor. Thank you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, pray this prayer out loud with me. Thank you, those hands in the back over here to my right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ask the Lord in your heart, say, Heavenly Father, now say it again, say, Heavenly Father. Come on, everybody, say, Heavenly Father. I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for giving good things into my life. I begin as a giver this morning by giving you my heart. It's sinful, it's broken, and hopeless. But I give you everything I've got. Forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Live in my heart. Stay with me. Never leave me all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me right now. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Amen. In just a moment, Pastor Chad's gonna close. You're gonna take communion. But I wanna pray for all of you right now that God would put in you the heart of a giver, that you would give as God leads you to give, that you would give according to the word of God. Some of you said, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling stirring. I should have given this morning. I didn't. 
There's, there's buckets in the back. You can begin your obedience right now. But I'm gonna pray for you, not only that you become a giver, but that God would confirm his blessing a favor in your life. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for people in this room. Lord, many of them are bought in, givers, givers that are extravagant in their giving. God, I pray you bless them. But God, I'm praying for people that are not givers right now, that you would stir in them to trust you by faith, to honor you with what they have so that God, you could give them more than they could ever imagine. Lord, forgive us when we're stingy. Forgive us when we're greedy. Forgive us when we hold back. Forgive us when we're dominated by fear. Lord, by faith, we give today, trusting you, Lord, to give us pressed down, shaken together, and running over, that the God who owns the cattle on the thousand hills will give us all that we need and more. And I thank you for it now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.